My name is Doug Hill, VP of Publishing here at Paradigm. During today's event, we're going to recommend specific stocks and cryptos for you to consider adding to your portfolios. And of course, to guide us along the way, I am joined by James Altucher, man of the hour Thank here you, at Paradigm. And so we're here for two very specific reasons. First off, AI 2.0 is red hot and provides huge upside for investors. Crypto and AI are positive, innovative, exponentially growing industries that are, that are happening right now. And you really have to pay attention to the sing signal and keep out the noise. Yeah, 100%. And investing during those tough times is why people come to talk to you because you kind of keep them on the straight and narrow and keep them focused on the long term, which I know a lot of your readers recommend, uh, uh, really appreciate. So there's a, there's a minefield happening in the markets this year, but we also have the benefits of AI and crypto, two exponentially growing industries that no matter what happens, these are industries that are going to continue to grow, even if they dip. Even if they crash, which they're not going to, but that's the time when you got to buy the dips, just like we did in December of 2022. Let's talk about one of your favorite AI companies that you're talking about right now. So what would you recommend now? What's new that people here haven't heard you talk about yet that you would like to recommend uh, to make a mention of a company that you find interesting in the AI space? Yeah, so, okay, I'm, you know, NVIDIA is getting all the buzz right now. Like, oh, you know, OpenAI has NVIDIA in the supercomputers and that's how they made ChatGPT and so on. NV NVIDIA is blowing away all the earnings, so they're up hundreds of percent. And NVIDIA is great. I don't have any problem with NVIDIA. They're going to continue to do well. But you got to, you always got to know the history of what you're investing in. Like, you know, invest, history, history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. Mm -hmm. And so when I think about that, there's, there's NVIDIA, AMD and Intel. And for the past 30 years, I have seen these companies flip-flop each other. Like, oh, Intel's the best. No, 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 AMD's the best. No, 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 NVIDIA's leaving them all in the dust. Intel and AMD are gonna go out of business. So these companies have traded places as the hot chip maker for as long as I've been investing. And it's going to happen again. So yes, NVIDIA's got the best chips. They've got the best software. They have. Specifically, they have super fast chips that make the data centers that are learning these large language models and creating models like open, you know, chat GPT. They're, they're powering all those data centers, but AMD just has developed their own chip, the MI300, that's probably just as fast, if not faster than Nvidia's top chip. And they just announced kind of a motherboard to control all the, the software and the networking aspects. That's very competitive with, with Nvidia's kind of secret sauce. And I think, and, but AMD has not gotten the love from investors that NVIDIA's had. So if you own an NVIDIA, no problem. You're not gonna do poorly with like the top AI company in the world, but it's already worth almost $2 trillion. It's not gonna continue going up hundreds of percent. AMD is much cheaper. They arguably have the be current best chip in the world. They arguably are competitive with NVIDIA on the software side. And I think that's gonna be the surprise darling in the chip space. Let's not forget, everybody's getting into AI now, all the big guys, Microsoft's building their own models, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, Google, and they don't wanna use Nvidia because Nvidia says, oh my gosh, everyone's using us, we could raise prices. Well, this is capitalism. Whenever you have somebody making a lot of money, competitors jump in. AMD, they're gonna be happy to buy AMD chips just to fight Nvidia on price. Also, a lot of these companies are making their own chips, believe it or not. Facebook wants to make their own chip, Google and so on. Amazon wants to make their own chips to power their data centers. So they're gonna be using um, intellectual property from ARM Holdings, and they're gonna be using AMD. So if I had to pick one of those, and again, I know we, we write about NVIDIA a lot and recommend it, and we, you mentioned it's, it's up nicely for us, but AMD is one I'm, I'm really excited about right now as like kind of a chip favorite. You know, when you're talking about AI, you're talking about several layers of what's happening here. There's layer, let's call it layer one, is the hardware providers like Nvidia or AMD or, or storage companies or whatever. Then you have the software guys. So Microsoft investing in open AI, the, the ones who are creating the AI. And then layer three, maybe you could call that 
services. So IBM, which normally we think of as hardware, IBM is actually giving consulting to every industry, like the farm industry or the food industries or whatever, on how to use AI to improve the profits and products and efficiency in their business. Then you have layer four, which is very, and we were discussing this over dinner yesterday, it's not every company needs to know have a large language model that covers everything from Shakespeare to the latest tweets yesterday. Sometimes there are, there are very industry specific needs that companies have for AI, which are gonna drastically improve their profits, their efficiency, and people don't realize that yet. Like some of these companies are turning into pure AI companies in the way they make their products. Their profits are gonna go up maybe 5X, 10X and so on. And that's, that's what I've been calling AI 2.0, where the real trillions of dollars are gonna be made because it won't be as, as competitive. The, a lot of these are already leaders in their space. And, but they're gonna just improve profits and stocks are valued as a multiple of profits. Well, I know obviously NVIDIA is up a ton, as you mentioned, I think last year was up 270% or something. Yeah. Uh, this year it's still up, uh, it's up yet again. So I love the AMD idea. Uh, so that's, that's the I'm first I'm super AMD. excited about AMD, and that's like that yeah. layer one. But yeah. I also have a, a, a couple layer four picks. Now your second pick that you're interested in is, uh, is, is, is Palantir. So uh, it, it, could you run through for people like w why you like that uh, play so much and, and what about it that's going on in the world that makes that a, a good investment right now? Sure, I mean, again, the world is, you can either be a pessimist or an optimist. And there's no benefits in life to being a pessimist, but let's just look with reality what's happening. We have a, a major proxy war in Ukraine right now. Mm -hmm. We have a potentially devastating proxy situation in, in Gaza where you have Iran, Russia, China, the US. In the Ukraine, for instance, Palantir, as soon as that war started, Palantir was brought in. Hey, here's our satellites that, are, that we're gonna send you every minute of what's happening on the ground. Uh, one, of the, one of the founders of Palantir is Peter Thiel, who's of course been on my podcast, and another guy, Joe Lonsdale. So Joe Lonsdale, very good chess player. I, I've known him for a long time. And we were having lunch once. He was the CEO of Palantir. And he said, he said to me, I don't even know if this is public info, but he said to me, hey, you wanna buy some of my shares? And Palantir was still a private company. And I said, how much are you selling them for? What are, what are they worth? Well, he said, Palantir is worth $5 billion right now at our last fundraising. This is before they were public, so yep. they just knew from VC's funding. Yep. And I said, no, because Palantir was uh, too big. Uh, you know, that, that $5 billion was too high. But of course, now it's worth you know, many multiples of that. I do regret not buying those shares, but it's not my style to invest in something, a private company worth, worth billions. But it's been a, it was a good company then, and it continues to just go straight up. So... Uh, but, but part of the task is looking at a company like that, saying it's good, but also, maybe we'll talk about this later, finding smaller competitors. I always, I like to have a plan A and a plan B. Plan A is, this is a great company that's gonna grow forever. Plan B is, what if the worst case happens? And whatever, I don't know what the worst case would be. Well, I li love the fact that they have billions of dollars in cash and no debt. I love the fact that they, they were funded by the CIA, so they're, they're basically in bed with the government and, and, they're, and, and then all the banks hire them and so on. So the, the plan B is I don't really see huge downside in a worst case scenario because they can always you know, buffer themselves up. So okay. I, I think it's a good, solid investment. Does it go up hundreds of percent from here? Eventually, but you know, I think it's a good, solid earner no matter what the economy does. But I had one last question here about big technology uh, and what they're actually doing in the AI space. So can, maybe there are like big tech firms, obviously you got Facebook, you got Apple, you got all these different big players, uh, Microsoft. What are they doing in the AI space that stands out to you right now? The big tech companies like, like Amazon, Google, Facebook? Yep, yep. Well, they don't want to use open AI. Right, that's owned mostly by Microsoft. And you see, Elon Musk is even suing OpenAI. He doesn't, he, he's so disgusted with them. So the big tech, again, this is capitalism. Capitalism has competition. So of course, Google has been developing its own AI model. And they, you know, they're obviously were having problems with it. It was all in the news the past few weeks. But Amazon is, is building their AI model, Apple is. So that means they're all looking at new chips, new software. Twitter with, um, you know, with, with Elon Musk is open sourcing Grok, which is their version of ChatGPT. And you know, I encourage people to play with, and I write this in the newsletter, I always give 
website ideas of, of cool AI companies to try out, but essentially competition is the name of the game. AI itself is a commodity. It's what you do with the AI. So what I'm seeing just in general in the industry is there's gonna be more and more niche AI. Kind of like what I said with Palantir, hey, can we look at aerial photographs of the Ukraine and tell who's an enemy and who's not an enemy? And of course, pharma, can we, can we make, without spending an extra billion dollars testing drugs, can we use AI to figure out the right compounds to get XYZ results and maybe, you know, get faster through clinical trials? Can we use AI for that? They're gonna save billions of dollars. Yeah. Every billion dollars you save might make your market cap $40 billion higher. So this is something that people have to look at. Don't just look at big tech. Look at the companies that are using AI to, for better or for worse, fire people and get more efficiencies. Every news organization is gonna fire all their reporters. Uh, a lot of manufacturing companies are gonna use you know, you know, Tesla's building the Optimus robot to, to insource manufacturing from China back to the U.S. That is a trillion dollar endeavor. Like all of these things together is what, again, is going to propel the U.S. for the next 50 years or more. Like nobody's even, like China's competitive, but no one's really competitive with our innovation. Despite the media saying, oh, China's going to catch up, blah, blah, blah. They're not. They don't. Yeah. They just copy. They don't have what, what we're doing. Well, and look, I, the, probably the top AI guy in China, Kai Fu Li, has been on my podcast many times. So he helped develop Siri. He's a world expert on AI. And he comes here to promote his books because the U.S. is where, where things are happening. What regulations should be placed on AI to uh, pre prevent uh, bad actors from using AI in nefarious, uh, in nefarious ways? Like, for example, you and I talked about um, how AI is, is really can generate video now yeah. of anyone that's online say anything you want them to say, kind of like a puppet. So what prevents a bad actor from saying, okay, well, this is what uh, this is, you know, Joe Biden says about some, some country and just put that out on, on the internet? Yeah, there's no safeguards that technically you can do. Like if someone's gonna make a deep fake, like, oh, here's Biden saying, he you know, loves to go to whorehouses or whatever. There's nothing you can do to prevent that from happening. Yeah. And, you know, and the, these deep, deep fakes are serious. Like you could get a call, an yep. actual phone call from let's say one of your kids yeah. and, and the call says, dad, I'm stuck on the highway. I don't have my ATM card. Can you send me you know, $10,000 to this Western Union? And you think it's your son and they'll verify all the information and, and you'll right away send the money. Those, deep, those, those, are, those kinds of scams are already happening. Those deep fakes are already happening. There's nothing you can do about it except to be aware. Just like when you get an email that says, hey, click here, there's some unclaimed money for you yeah. in Nigeria. You click and you now have a virus on your Wait, computer. I, I'm not supposed to click those? <laughs> no, I click never, those all the time. That's never. the only thing I click on. <laughs> right, so, that's, so your, your computer I probably would not use anymore. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but you know, it, it already falls under the laws. Like there's laws of slander, there's laws against theft. Right. There's nothing you could really do. It's just like regulating the internet. You can't really regulate the internet beyond just good faith laws. Like don't slander, don't steal money from people, don't lure people into potentially violent situations, don't spread, you know, hate if you, you know, depending on what the definition of, of hate speech is. Yeah. So there's nothing really extra you could do. But by the way, I do want to say, everybody I talk to who, who, who knows, you know, little knowledge is a dangerous thing. So, so many, I went to this dinner a few weeks ago of all these physicists and, and scientists and uh, Pulitzer Prize winning, uh, uh, you know, journalists about science. And all they could talk about was that AI is gonna suddenly become conscious and robots are gonna eliminate all the humans. That's just not going to happen. Right, right. AI is not going conscious. There is nothing in the AI code which could even suggest human consciousness. You know, let's just take ChatGPT as an example. Very, very simply, here's how it works. You put in some words like, you know, what should I eat today to lose weight? And it figures out what words, given the trillions of words in its database and the trillions of texts and sentences and every book and every Wikipedia page and every tweet and every Reddit post, given all of its knowledge, it basically takes a set of words, a question, and it gives you the set of words it thinks are most likely to occur next. It's a probabilistic machine. 
and it's very, very good. No one's ever been able to figure out how to do that before. They figured it out. So, but it's no, it doesn't work like the human brain. Doesn't act, it does, it's not modeled after the human brain. There is nothing brain-like in there. And it's certainly, so back in 1990, back in 1992 or 1990, I was offered a job at a place called MIT Lincoln Laboratories. It was a joint project between the Department of Defense and MIT. And if I had taken that job, my job would have been, okay, here's objects in space. Use AI to determine which objects are space junk and which objects are nuclear missiles heading towards the United States so we know to fire nuclear missiles back. So we've had the technology forever uh -huh. to turn on AI to launch its own nuclear war. And obviously, no one in their right mind in any country would do that. And it's not happening now just because we have ChatGPT. You right, know, this yeah. technology has been around already, and we haven't created a Terminator. There's no Terminator being created. Although, there was news yesterday. In the, there was some Middle Eastern press conference showing some robot, and the robot fondled the reporter. <laughs> inappropriately. So I don't know if that was planned uh, by the programmers as like a joke, but it wasn't taken as a joke. And uh, uh, oh, wow. so there's going to be things like that. But there, there's nothing, the, all, all of these, even scientists who claim to be experts, there's no Terminator happening, there's no AI dystopia happening, and, there, and it's, there's no consciousness happening. Okay, so let's talk about what is happening then. So we've got ChatGPT where we can have it grade a, a paper or give us ideas for what to write about if we want and things like things of that nature. Um, so we have a question here about how AI might be able to use be used in the oil and gas industry. So great question. All right. So, like, what are the characteristics uh, that make uh, for a good um, application for AI? Like, you, you need a, you know, look, big data, right? And so yeah. how, how could it be used in the AI, uh, in the oil and gas industry? Okay, I'll, I'll, let's make up an app on the fly. Okay. Oil and gas industry. I'm gonna take uh, photographs of a plot of land or, or, or the ocean, you know, there's a lot of oil in the, in the ocean, but let's just say a plot of land. I'm gonna take photographs maybe on the ground or from space or whatever. Maybe I'll do a little bit of what's called seismic data, but let's say not, mm -hmm. and then I already know from past photos, from thousands and tens of thousands of past photos of areas of land, mm -hmm. where there's oil and where there isn't oil. Oh, we drilled oil here, we were successful. We drilled oil here and we weren't successful. So I'm gonna take 5,000 of the successful examples and 5,000 of the unsuccessful examples and I'm gonna say, I'm gonna build an AI program that says, find out what, Given a new photograph of a new area of land, right, yeah. does it probably look like a successful oil example or an unsuccessful oil example? And then that's my stage one. Okay. Stage two might be I'll add more data, like seismic data, which is particular to the oil and gas industry. I might add you know, what happened in other plots of land near there. So the more data I can add, the better. And the idea is then the AI will learn to recognize patterns. Oh, this is probably a land where there's oil. Doesn't look like it but it probably is. And that's when AI is interesting because then it discovers things that nobody would have expected. And this is why games, way back, games like chess, go, backgammon, were always interesting because it turns out that the AI would come up with moves and creative ideas that humans never would have thought of, but it does this by seeing millions of examples of winning games and losing games. And that's how almost every AI, that, that's how every trained AI works. ChatGPT started off as an unsupervised trained AI, and that's a whole other category. It's a little more complicated to explain, yeah. but that's essentially, for oil and gas, that's how, I would, um, that's how I would make an app on the oil and gas industry. And that's probably, where, if I could come up with it without knowing anything, someone's already doing it. Yeah, that. that's what I was gonna ask you, how many, which companies are actually using AI to identify those, those, those plots? That, that's why AI is a little bit of a commodity. So if there was a, com a, com a company doing that app, okay, I'm not gonna invest in that company because that's a commodity, but I would invest in the oil and gas companies using that because they're yeah. gonna make millions of dollars more in profit. Eventually AI, we're just talking about oil and gas here, eventually AI will be massively used by that industry to find new sources of energy where, where nobody expected to look. You know, the world's a big place. The ocean floor is completely unexplored for oil. So uh, it's gonna be, it's gonna generate hundreds of billions of dollars of profits in the oil and gas industry. By the way, we didn't talk about pharma, banking, oh, yeah, yeah. food, even the, the perfume industry. Okay, perfumes 
are all synthetically made scents. They, they might smell like lavender, but they're not really lavender because lavender and flowers go bad in a few days. The synthetic scents have to stay around longer. But it takes very complicated chemistry to make a perfume. So guess what? IBM, the, the oldest, most boring, stodgiest tech company on the planet, is all over the perfume industry teaching them how to use AI to make new perfumes. So if, if people are getting laid off in, in certain areas, where will AI new jobs be created? That's a really great question. And look, we don't know all the answers. If we did, we would know all the new industries that are going to be created over the next 5, 10, 50 years. Yeah. But you just look at history, OK? Every horse and buggy driver, 100% of them, went Drive Uber now. Yeah. They're Uber drivers. They're Uber drivers, or they work making cars or designing, you know, not immediately, but they didn't all start dri driving Model Ts the day after the horse and buggy business. You know, it's a, a period that happens over years. Like, nobody makes VHS videos anymore. No one works at Blockbusters anymore. I had the CEO of Blockbuster, the last CEO of Blockbuster was on my podcast a few weeks ago, and it was, I wouldn't say it was a peaceful end to the video recorder business, but it, was, it, it crashed and died and burned and everybody went unemployed and they didn't all find jobs at Netflix, but they all found jobs and things to do. And again, new industries will be created that will be based on AI, uh, new industries. Like let's say there's, let's say all manufacturing is insourced, not outsourced, but insourced uh, back to uh, the U.S. Well, now you're going to need to hire. Now there's nobody in, in that industry in the U.S. They're all in China. But now you're going to have a trillion dollar industry move back to the U.S. Yes, the people on the floor, on the assembly line, won't be people. They'll be robots. And yes, there will be other robots watching the robots on the assembly line. Like, like there's a company, Dynatrace, DT is the symbol, makes software to watch, to watch the robots to make sure the assembly line is work, working correctly. But there will be people who will be building these factories. There will be people who will be running these factories and managing the software. There will be systems administrators that will turn software on and off and have to know the inner workings of the software. There will be people writing the software. There will be people doing the accounting of the companies writing the software and human resources and so on. So new industries, if the economy grows, which you know we think there's going to be tens of trillions of dollars of, of growth coming from AI over the next few years, everyone now thinks this, that means tens of trillions of dollars of new companies will start yeah. and those, that money will be directed towards salaries and pension funds and, you know, of course, the government through taxes. So all of these things will filter down into the economy and create new industries, new jobs, new services. I mean, look, where are we heading? Maybe we're all heading to the fact that nobody wants to leave their home anymore and I'm just going to like watch Netflix. I'm just going to watch what, whatever Netflix tells me to watch. I'm going to get delivered whatever burrito AI tells me. I'm never going to leave my house. Bad things happen when people go outside. They go out and buy like <laughs> wizard hats or whatever and do crazy things. Maybe that's where we're all heading, but I don't mind that either. I like Netflix. I, don't, I didn't picture you as a burrito guy. Well, I don't like cheese. Oh, so, oh yes. no. but I don't mind just sitting and doing nothing. Burrito without a che without cheese is not. Is this no is the burrito, first time coming friend. here was the first time I left my house in like two weeks. So I'm fine with <laughs> AI totally taking know. over all that. You said this numerous times on calls: is that the AI is going to have a big impact on every single industry, but the boring industries, things like tax process, processing tax returns, right? AI huge data sets with, with laws in different areas and all the numbers and everything that goes into producing a, a tax return. There's going to be some big, there's going to be some innovation there probably. In farming too, we, you, you send oh, yeah. people down to the Consumer Electronics Show in, in Vegas and how like John Deere and tractors are yeah. using- Biggest display of the conference yeah. is a tractor company, yeah. John Deere. What do they have to do with AI? Well, automated driving makes the, allows the farmer to do other things. Oh, by the way, not every square inch of a farm needs to be sprayed with pesticide. You could save across the industry. You're, you're going to save billions of dollars because John Deere tractors have figured out where to spray the pesticide and where not using AI. So that's what I mean as the AI 2.0 is that these companies are going to enormously increase their profits. Their stocks are going to go way up. The, all the way down to the customers are going to have more free time, more income because of using AI. All right. So... Um I think that we're reaching the end of our discussion here. I know we talked about a number of different uh, 
specific companies. But you also mentioned one other one prior to us getting on here that you wanted to, do you remember what that one was, that CG? Oh yeah, so, what was it? okay, Palantir, we talked about We talked already. about that, yep. Yeah, so look, Palantir is a, a, a $54 billion market cap company now. Yeah. And so what, so what other companies take data and determine if there's fraudulent behavior occurring, for instance, okay. or if there's a cybersecurity threat happening. So, company I'm still looking at, I mean, but it's very interesting to me, uh, uh, Cognite CGNT, and they basically will take all the data in a bank and determine, okay, here's a possibly fraudulent transaction, here's possibly a terrorist transaction, or they'll take all the transactions happening at a company and saying, oh, some, there's corporate espionage maybe happening here, or there's weird, you know, there's a weird threat. So, you know, the threat detection space yeah. is very interesting and, and CGNT is like almost like a mini Palantir. And this is a, an investing specific thing, but CGNT is also a spin-off. They were part of a larger company, Verint, and they spun off to become a, a, a new, smaller company focused on threat detection. Verint didn't want to be in that space anymore. There's an interesting thing that happens with every spin-off is that the investors in the larger company sell off the spinoff because they like the larger company, they might not like the spinoff. So the price goes down for like a year or so. And then people realize, oh, it's a different company now. And they start, new investors start buying it. Right. So this happens with every spinoff. It, it, it goes down and down and down, and then it goes up. I remember this just when I was trading back in 2002, Smuckers, you know, the jam company. Who doesn't they, know Smuckers? They spun out of, I'm trying to remember, they spun out of Procter & Gamble. Stock went down, but it was a great profitable company trading for 10 times earnings. And of course it became an enormous buy like as, yeah. as a spinoff play. So spinoffs are always an interesting play to look at. And again, that's why it's more than just knowing, oh, what industry is gonna pop or what company is gonna pop. Like it's just understanding kind of the, the fundamentals of, of risk and investing and what actually happens behind the scenes with investing. Cause it's, it's usually, you know, it, it, it ha everything comes together when you make a good investment. Yeah. Including luck. There's always a luck factor. Well, if I didn't, I ha if, I, if I didn't have bad luck, I wouldn't have luck at all, James. That's how, <laughs> that's how it goes. All right. Well, I think we're wrapping up here. Uh, you know, I, oh, one thing I want to add. I oh, do okay. want to add. We're not wrapping up here. I take that back. I do want to add. I know a lot of people are, have this fear of missing out. Like I hear it all the time. Like, oh, I'm going to wait now for Bitcoin to dip or for Nvidia to go cut, get cut in half. It'll eventually get cut in half, blah, blah, blah. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. But don't, I've had fear of missing out so many times, but here's the solution. Just keep an eye out for exponentially growing industries. Be optimistic. Don't focus on all the negative things that are happening. Look for where the opportunities are, because there's always, the economy's still growing. There's always opportunities as the economy grows. So. And now we see this AI is no one's going to hold that back. It can't get regulated. No one's going to hold crypto back. No one's holding robotics back. No one's holding genomics back. Uh, so look, you don't benefit from pessimism. You know, the market's at all-time highs. So anybody who's ever bet against the market as of today has been completely wrong. So now's the time to just be optimistic, be forward-thinking. Don't worry about the past. There's no fear of missing out. Innovations are happening faster than ever because of technology increasing. Innovations feed more inno innovations. So things are starting today, and I would just go forward from today. So you have, uh, have all those plays at your disposal to decide what you want to do with those. So thank you very much, and we'll talk to you all soon.